Yeah, this one might be daunting, but I'm going to attempt it anyway. It doesn't seem like it would be daunting. To younger people generally unfamiliar with 20th century cinema, it is easy to imagine them not considering 1941's The Maltese Falcon all that spectacular a film achievement. I mean, that is essentially how I felt when I first viewed it at the age of 13 or so. I was very enamored of Casablanca, which I had seen earlier around that time, but The Maltese Falcon, in spite of having a more appealing premise to me, or at least poster art, Sam Spade dual-wielding pistols that are like he's a John Woo protagonist. The Maltese Falcon was released the same year as Citizen Kane, which I had also seen prior, and I wasn't nearly as impressed by Falcon as I was Kane. Now to be fair, that is the go for any cinephiles, I'm sure. We all love the Maltese Falcon, but Citizen Kane is Citizen Kane. John Huston is great, but he's no Orson Welles. Perhaps. Perhaps not. These days, the Maltese Falcon is almost as impressive to me, if not as much, a film production as Citizen Kane is. Performing a cross-textual analysis on both would be very useful insofar as observing them both as works... Observing how both works are, slash, as constructed, two debut feature films from two classic filmmakers. Well, Wells really debuted of 1938's Too Much Johnson, but whatever, whatever. Kane was the auteur's most lavish fantasy realised, carte blanche awarded to a young, ambitious theatre director and performer. Wells was always well-funded in his younger years, having received a large inheritance upon his father's passing. Ironic that he was consistently an international beggar almost from his thirties onward. But yeah, it's always made sense to me that Wells was able to accomplish as much as he as he had. Wells was a obviously a phenomenal theatrical artist and radio personality, and you know, it seems Hollywood had a lot of faith in him, believing him he'd be the next great entertainer of the nineteen forties. The successor to W. C. Fields, perhaps. But enough about Wells. Let's discuss John Huston's backstory leading up to the Maltese Falcon. John Huston had first attempted to make his break in Hollywood way back in 1931 as an aspiring writer for the new era of talkies. His father, Walter Huston, an actor, may have helped him out to some extent in finding a scripted work. John Huston worked on screenplays for a number of years, culminating in his receiving writing credits for two noted commercial hits in Sergeant York and High Sierra, both released in 1941. Upon the success of High Sierra, Houston, in his thirties, persuaded Warner Brothers to let him direct his first picture, and assured them it would be a small, inexpensive production. They accepted, gave him his choice of subject, and so Houston adapted Dashiell Hammett's 1930 novel, The Maltese Falcon. Jack Warner would subsequently approve of John Houston's screenplay, and the production went underway. And this was in spite of the novel having been adapted to the screen twice during the 1930s, and neither being a particular commercial hit. Interestingly, the Maltese Falcon novel had served to popularise that hard-boiled genre in literature, Hammett Sam Spade preceding Chandler's Philip Marlowe, and it's something which its 1941 film adaptation would be similarly responsible for in the cinematic context category, known as film noir. Obviously, Humphrey Bogart portrayed both Sam Spade and Philip Marlowe over the course of the 1940s, assisting the elevation of both characters to a popularly iconic status. I honestly find the Maltese Falcon's production, as I said, similarly impressive to Citizen Kane's. Wells had so much to work with. An ambitious screenplay, and we're not even going to get into that, required an ambitious technical undertaking. Whereas Houston's streamlined, simplistic script of its witty dialogue sourced apparently entirely from Hammett's prose was utterly transformed into magic by means of filmmaking fluency alone. <clears throat> well, let me explain. Kane's screenplay lent itself to the lavish production techniques it employed. If I now handed you Citizen Kane's screenplay and some actors, you'd think, okay, this requires a lot of logistics and money, but if we have those, it can be done, maybe. I don't know. So yes, no matter what, pulling off Citizen Kane was going to be a grand undertaking, and Wells enacted it beautifully. The best film it could have been. Well, except for that goofy octopus prop. Now... On the other hand, if I'd given you screenplay for the Maltese Falcon, gifted you some actors, you might scoff and say, no problem. So you'd film it, show me, you'd embarrass yourself, and then I'd show you John Huston's The Maltese Falcon. 
Everything Houston did that you didn't do, those are the secrets of effective narrative filmmaking. Houston's undertaking here was wholly proto-Kubrickian in its pre-production fastidiousness, essentially planning every shot in advance in order to ensure the maximum production efficiency. Houston was extremely determined to stay under budget whilst communicating all of the prowess that he clearly felt as though this narrative as a novel intrinsically possessed. Insofar as Houston just copied word for word Hammett's dialogue, it really was just a matter of deciding how it was going to be storyboarded, essentially. This film was essentially de facto storyboarded in Houston's brain, represented as a series of annotations over and between the text of the screenplay. This is the film to champion the utilization of angles in film photography. Every frame is a dynamic image for posterity. The vector is always extremely considered. As I said, Houston is expertly extrapolating, emphasizing the juice of a scene's tension through delightfully deliberate angles, zooms, and cuts. Every shot is so considered. More than a comic book or a film inspired by a comic book's panels, it's more like Houston identifies the three or four most important elements of a scene and enhances them by cutting to evidence of a tension within the character interaction. Houston realizes that the nature of the shot is everything. Cinema is a series of staged moving photographs, and this is what sets it apart from the flatness of theater and the language prison of word association that is literature. Now, cinema at this time in history still isn't too far removed from theater. The camera's rigidity is still being gradually unfastened, right? And so a film, and particularly sound films at this point, like a stage play, is still centered around actors delivering dialogue among sets. Given that this film is mostly interior dialogue sequences, Houston chooses to illustrate this potentially theatrical narrative with these regular manifestations of filmic supremacy. And yeah, so what we have here is, of course, one of the greatest scripts ever written. You know, each dialogue scene in this film is the envy of every theatrical playwright. And then its realization is truly even more so the envy of every film director. And also, must be mentioned, when it came time to actually shooting the Maltese Falcon, Houston could not have had an abler ally in legendary Hollywood cinematographer Arthur Edison. Edison. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. I'm going to pronounce it Edison, just, just, just for convenience sake for myself. No doubt whether, no doubt, without Edison's command of lighting, this wouldn't be nearly as effective a film as it is. This film features some of the slickest, yet subdued, black and white photography of all time. It makes up so much of the mystical formula which en enchants this film, its iconic aura. Compare this film's photography back to back with previous legendary 1941 noir film of the day, I Wake Up Screaming. That film is brilliantly, brilliantly photographed courtesy of Edward Kronjaga. Um, Kronjaga also had a hand in shooting other prior FODDs, The Doors Bird of Paradise and, hilariously, Dwan's The Gorilla. Although Konjaga's work in I Wake Up Screaming is so much more overt and obvious than Edison's work on the Maltese Falcon. I'm arguably more impressed with Edison's work, wherein the lighting is both bolstered by the obvious in-frame sources, which, which you note when you watch the film, and also seemingly from some off-frame setups as well. Or at least I assume so. See, that's the thing. I Wake Up Screaming, it is generally evident how the film is being lit, though it's still phenomenally impressive and audacious in its immaculate precision, but the Maltese Falcon, I am more unsure as to how it is lit the way it is. It is not entirely lit by the lights you see in the film's frames. There's a certain glim shine to the players' faces, which isn't necessarily present in, say, 1946's The Big Sleep, though it is to an extent, now that I think of it, in Bogart's Casablanca. Edison knew how to light his face. Of course, Ed Edison photographed Casablanca as well. Edison had photographed, among other titles, actually, Alan Dwan's Robin Hood, Raoul Walsh's The Thief of Baghdad, and Harry Hoyt's The Lost World during the silent era, during the 1920s. And then in the 1930s, he photographed All Quiet on the Western Front, Waterloo Bridge, Frankenstein, Flesh, the John Ford film, if you've seen that one, The Old Dark House, The Invisible Man, and Mutiny on the Bounty, all throughout the 1930s. Interestingly, during that decade, Edison directed the second Maltese Falcon adaptation, the more humorously inclined Satan Met a Lady. At the year 1940, 
Edison photographed They Drive by Night, Ferrara Walsh, which is another very early entry of what we now consider to be film noir. But yes, after the Maltese Falcon, as I said, Edison shot the other most iconic Bogart film, Casablanca. And then he shot John Huston's subsequent picture, Across the Pacific, which is also released in 1942, along with Casablanca. Edison shot his last film in 1948, and then he passed away in 1970. Actually, apparently Edison was involved from 1911 at a film studio in Fort Lee, New Jersey, back when that was actually the first motion picture industry in America. It's not that well known these days, but yeah, very interesting. Where Thomas Edison was based, you see. They moved to California partially because they, they were, could avoid Thomas Edison's patents. The California, it said that the California patent offices are off, patent offices were really lax. It's interesting. Um, so yes, I have become an obsessive of the Maltese Falcon, as many true film fanatics tend to do. This is a 20th century straightforward narrative picture which holds the psychic secrets of cinema communication. I long theorised that such a film would exist, but it has been right in front of me from the earliest stages of this film-gorging odyssey which replaced a regular, proper job-holding life for myself. <laughs> you know, I will ask this. Is Floyd Fursby the most iconic film name that has no real character to attach to it? The other two which come to my mind as candidates are George Kaplan and Arch Stanton. Oh, I shall also ask this. Is there a finer debut film acting credit than Sidney Greenstreet in The Maltese Falcon? Greenstreet had been a theatre performer throughout his acting career. This film was his first. And I double-checked, Orson Welles has film acting credits listed on IMDb prior to Citizen Kane, although mostly for narration, just to asterisk that. The only major competitor to Green Street here off the top of my head, and it does absolutely qualify, is Yoon Boon Kim in the 2002 South Korean film The Way Home, which I absolutely recommend everyone go and view. Here's a tip I'd like to give to first-time viewers of The Maltese Falcon, or, or, or returning viewers if, if you're so inclined. I don't normally think of this when watching a film when I'm watching a film in the English language, but I prefer, and would recommend to others, watch this film with subtitles. That way one can truly appreciate the dialogue. And also note that the way that, for example, Miss Wanderlei, at that time, before she's revealed as O'Shaughnessy, the way she, she adds information to her story, her initial story, which is revealing to Spade and Miles, she adds information to her story at abrupt times, so we as an audience can observe how she attempts to deceive those around her. Actually, I love the degree to which O'Shaughnessy actually does manage to deceive Spade until the end. Sometimes I suspect the reason Spade gave her up had less to do with avenging Miles, as he claims, and more to do with bitterness at her having successfully manipulated him up to this point, especially given how smugly he claimed to not have been fooled by her earlier fibs in the narrative. It's interesting to think about. At least I think so. And you know, I love how the Maltese Falcon doesn't appear to take place in the real world. I mean, it does, but it doesn't. Dashiell Hammett has written how Sam Spade is, quote, a dream man in the sense that he is what most of the private detectives I worked with would like to have been and in their cockier moments thought they approached. I find that interesting to note because I've always found many great film noirs... Uh, partially so, because of a certain ethereal, dreamlike ambiance about them. Their characters feel more like dynamic archetypes than people we would meet on the street, and the visual pronunciation of moments and events are far more romantic and stylized than the candid depth of lived existence offers. Strangely enough, the ugliness and amorality of the film's cast, suggesting the rank city of sleaze veneer so common of American crime fiction, it assists this film in seeming more an alternate universe than our own. These stories seem to take place amongst a caricature of perceived human ugliness, and it's an engrossing universe in and of itself. Think the kind of thing which inspired the noir-verse that was Frank Miller's Sin City comic book, for example. Don't forget, Sam Spade is no Rick Blaine, or even Philip Marlowe. He's a rather nasty man, you know? Only rendered likeable for him standing up to those attempting to bully him, usually dryly outwitting them. The Maltese Falcon in particular, given the nature of its titular MacGuffin, roots itself in tales of crusaders and monarchs, the legacy of a centuries-old treasure hunt, 
albeit reduced in the modern world, to a cynical series of frets and transactions. In its own way, it feels as fantastic an adventure slash journey as a film set during the Middle Ages might. Knights Templar searching for the precious falcon amongst a ruthless, untrustworthy marketplace. Every event depicted in the Maltese Falcon has an aura of legend and significance, as though it too is a chapter of an extended historical epic. Well, to say this film operates like a dream, well, as you may have realised, that's very interesting really. Now let's address that. <clears throat> the first glimpse I ever received of this film was a clip of Sam Spade stating, in response to an officer's query about the Falcon, that is the that it is the yeah stuff that dreams are made of. Now viewing that clip out of context, this comes across as a character referring to a piece of treasure as the stuff that dreams are made of. With this obscuration, I was under the impression that this object was valuable and Sam Spade was speaking in awe of it. But in the appropriate context of the film, the Falcon is fake. And so what are dreams made of, Sam? Well, lead, I suppose. Actually, initially, celluloid nitrate, and eventually, celluloid acetate, or polyester, with silver salts. Now it's all digital, though. But Sam Spade was intrinsically right. Dreams are based off of deception, illusion, trickery. Remind us of something? In illustrating its player's hunt for the treasure of historical legend, the Maltese Falcon itself, as a text, certainly became the stuff that aspiring filmmakers' dreams are made of. You want to know how to make a film? Watch the Maltese Falcon. Keep watching it. Cinematic lucidity can be attained by continually viewing the Maltese Falcon. It is worth analysing frame by frame, viewing on LSD, experiencing it over and over again. You may learn as much about every other film ever made, as much as you will, The Maltese Falcon.